Hello, Scale It Up Nation, and welcome to Wastewater Thursday. We have spent this entire week celebrating Industrial Water Week. We started Monday with pre-treatment. Tuesday was boilers. Yesterday was cooling. Well, today is wastewater. And of course, that has to deal with filtration, clarification, coagulation, flocculants, aeration, microbiological treatment, filter presses, oxidation, gray water, black water, recycling, equalization basins, dissolved air flotation systems, induced air flotation, settling tanks, sand filters, mixing tanks, water analysis, recycling, reuse polymers. Oh my goodness, there's so much more when it comes to wastewater. So folks, all of those things to say, we are celebrating Wastewater Thursday, and wastewater is probably one of the most complicated aspects of our industry, but I bet we could probably say that for each and every segment about industrial water treatment. Wastewater, if everything remains the same, normally the program runs pretty well. The problem is Operators don't always do the same thing. They don't always follow our procedures. They might go home a little early one day, so maybe they make the tank a little bit more dilute. They make the tank a little bit more concentrated. And that, of course, plays havoc with our program. And then they call us, and then we get the privilege of going in there and trying to figure out what they said they didn't do. Of course, I know I'm the only one with this issue. Nobody else has this problem. I will say when you can automate things, that eliminates that and that does make our job a little bit easier. Well, I am kind of sad to say that we only have two days left to celebrate Industrial Water Week, but I'm not sad because it's almost over. I'm sad because I'm having so much fun bringing this information to you and looking at all of the posts that you guys are doing to hashtag IWW20. So folks, I, I just think it's awesome, especially in the year 2020, when we've had stay at home orders, we're having to work differently, we're having to go to conferences differently. We can see that we're all still out there and we are industrial water treaters. So if you haven't hashtag a picture, a video, a quote or something to IWW20, you got today and tomorrow to do it. For those of you that have already done that, I urge you to continue that process because I tell you, I'm really enjoying all of those. You know, when I think about wastewater, I can't help but think about one of my friends, Kevin Cope. And Kevin has been a fantastic board member of the Association of Water Technologies. He's also been a fantastic trainer on the education committee when it comes to wastewater. And Kevin, of course, heads up that team where we teach wastewater with the Association of Water Technologies. Well, Kevin was very gracious. And last year, he came on the show to talk about wastewater. It was actually such a good show. We had two parts. It was part one and part two, episodes 78 and 79. So here is a listen into that episode with Kevin Cope. So once primary clarification is done, we move into secondary. And secondary clarification is really where you're going to take out some of the dissolved materials, specifically the BOD, COD, things that can be biologically broken down, all right? In our industry, I don't know what the percentage would be, but I don't think we're going to see a lot of the secondary treatment. We may. A lot of, a lot of the food plants, almost every food plant, will have secondary treatment. And what happens there is... You have bugs. And when I started in this industry, and the first time I heard somebody call them bugs, I just looked at them like, really? That's the word you use? And that is the word that is accepted when we talk in this industry. So what happens is you have these aeration ponds where bubbling air all the time. And there's bugs in there. And these bugs will eat the organics and break them down. Okay, And these bugs will break these organics down, cleaning the water, and then this water that has all these bugs in it will be taken and brought into a clarifier, just like we just talked about, where they'll settle out. The clean water will continue. We'll get into where the clean water goes in a minute. But the, the sludge, the bug sludge that settles to the bottom, that is one of two things can happen to that. They can either recycle that back to the beginning 
of the uh, secondary treatment, or they can waste it to get rid of some of the bugs. Now, here's why, and this, this is another little way somebody explained this to me that stuck with me my entire career. If you think of the biological aerobic digester, it's what is called an aerobic digester, there's air present as a community. And you think of that as being people, okay? And you have these bugs, basically people, and you have young bugs, you have medium age bugs, and you have old bugs. And if you think of our society, really the young people, the young babies and stuff, really don't do a whole lot of work for the society. But now you get to the middle age, you know, young adults to, you know, um, little older adults, really who do the primary work within our society. Then you have the elderly, which really don't do a lot of work. So what happens is, in this bug community now, if you start getting too young, the bugs are too young, you don't get a lot of work. If the bugs start getting too old, you don't get a lot of work, work being removed of the organics. So what these customers will do is they'll take this sludge and they'll analyze it. And they'll say, well, we're getting too old. We're going to waste some of the sludge to move the, bu the, the sludge age more down into the medium range. And, and conversely, if we have too young of a sludge, we won't waste. We'll let those bugs become older and become more in that center group. And so I, I, that's always stuck with me on how to explain biological treatment. So what you're trying to do is have a healthy community of bugs, which break down the organics and, and clean the water and taking the organics out. And you do that by aeration, where you have the air, just like our society, air. You have food, food being the waste that's coming in. And then you have the bugs, the communities that are breaking this material down. And again, that's called secondary treatment. Kevin, thanks again. Uh, Kevin's talented in wastewater. He's also a very talented painter. As a thank you for coming on Scaling Up H2O, he painted me a scene which I'm actually looking at right now across my desk. So, Kevin, thank you for that. Thank you for contributing to the wastewater community. And I look forward to seeing you as soon as we can get back together again. When was the last time you wish you had a t-shirt that could tell the world that you have the best job in the world? I have received so many compliments on our first Scaling Up H2O t-shirt, the only t-shirt ever made specifically for water treaters, that we decided to come out with our own line of t-shirts specifically for you, the water treater. Go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash shop to see our designs and get one or all of them for your very own. That's scalinguph2o.com forward slash shop. Well, folks, something we have been doing to celebrate each and every day of Industrial Water Week is trivia. So here we go again, one more installment of Industrial Water Treatment Jeopardy. This bacteria grows in the absence of free oxygen and derives oxygen from breaking down complex substances. What is anaerobic bacteria? The agglomeration of colloidal or suspended matter brought about by the addition of some chemical to a liquid by contact or other means. What is coagulation? The biochemical decomposition of organic matter that results in the formation of mineral or simpler organic compounds. What is digestion? This is what DAF actually stands for. What is dissolved air flotation? The coming together or coalescing of multiple particles in a liquid. What is flocculation? So how was your score today? How did you do on wastewater industrial water treatment jeopardy? Again, I hope these questions get you thinking so you can figure out some new things that you can learn and then ultimately teach that to someone else. Well, folks, each and every day this week, we have been enjoying a brand new installment of Detective H2O from our friend James McDonald. Well, let's see what Detective H2O is up to today. Oh. 
Welcome to Detective H2O, The Case of Breaking Free. The rain ran serpentine paths down the windows of the rusty blue Ford as Herbert Henry Oxidane, P.I., CWT, sat waiting for Johnny Keelan to open a side powerhouse door at Pork Belly's Processing. When the lanky man's shaggy head popped out, the water detective made a run for it, dodging raindrops the best he could. Get in here, H2O, before you melt. I'm running between the drops. Let's see this reverse osmosis system of yours. Right this way, said Johnny as he snaked his way through the building. Like I said on the horn, this RO system goes south real fast. We'll clean it, clean it good, and a week later, maybe two. It's moping along, begging to be taken to the cleaners again. How do you determine when it needs to be cleaned? Well, we're using the normalization program provided by the membrane manufacturer. When the normalization permeate flows drop by 10 to 15 percent, and the pressure drops increase by 15 percent, we clean. We're barely keeping up with the permeate demand. Hmm, can you tell me about the water you're processing through the RO system? Oh yeah, we're the largest pork belly processing plant this side of the Mississippi, you see. That requires a lot of water. We get our water directly from the Grace Noel River. After filtration, clarification, and disinfection, some of the water comes to this RO system to make high purity water for us. Our silt density index is run daily. It is always spot on, showing good quality water for RO membranes. Our free chlorine test before the RO is also always spot on, before the dechlorination step, you see. Yet despite my crew babying this system, the membranes have to be cleaned far more frequently than we ever imagined. That can't be good for them. Have you sent any of the membranes out for an autopsy to determine what is fouling them? Yes, three times. It is always biological fouling. Biological fouling. Interesting. Let's take a look. I'd like to walk down the length of the system, see the chemical feed points, review your data, take a look at the autopsy reports, and run a few tests myself. Let's start with the walkthrough. For the next several hours, the water detective got the scoop on the pork belly's processing water treatment system. Everything appeared to be ship shape. This was a well run plant, and as far as he could tell, well designed. The crew's care and dedication were obvious. Figured out the culprit yet, detective? Not quite yet, but I have a hunch. Let's go collect some water right before the chlorine disinfectant is added. We'll need a clean bucket. After collecting the water sample, Detective H2O lined up several beakers with 100 mLs of the water sample in each, prepared a diluted bleach solution, and carefully injected different amounts of the solution into each water sample. After thoroughly stirring, he started the timer. In the meantime, he also tested for ammonia. Earlier, the water detective had calculated the residence time of the chlorine disinfectant in the system from the point of injection to the point of dechlorination just before the RO system. It was 25 minutes. After this time elapsed, he tested each 100 ml water sample for free chlorine. Then he fired up his computer, barely more than an abacus, and graphed out the data. Lastly, he smiled, or at least he defined it as a smile. Johnny, noticing the change in the water detective's face, said, I don't know whether to be scared or encouraged by that. Uh, smile you've got going on there. Are you onto the culprit? Definitely encouraged. I may have cracked this case wide open. Take a look at this. I added different levels of diluted bleach to each of the water samples you saw me pour out. The chlorine concentration added increased from left to right as I had them setting on the lab counter. I gave them time for the free chlorine to react with whatever was in the water, the same time it would have in the system out there. After this time, I measured the remaining free chlorine. Finally, I graphed it out here. See this curve? Yes, there's a bump in the middle. Is that normal? Well, yes and no, but it's what I suspected I would see in your case. When chlorine is introduced to a system, it reacts with several things. Our desire is for it to react with the microbes in the water first so the water is properly disinfected. That way your membranes won't foul. Unfortunately, there are other components in the water that can react with the chlorine even faster. The typical culprit is ammonia. Ammonia can get into surface waters from farm runoff and so forth, when ammonia reacts with chlorine, it forms chloramines such as monochloramine, a form of combined chlorine. 
Now, chloramines are a disinfectant, but some research shows that monochloramine may be 25 times less effective than free chlorine at killing microbes. To get the killing power of free chlorine, you must first react with all the ammonia. After the ammonia is gone and the chloramine reactions are at completion, the remaining chlorine disinfectant you add will form free chlorine. This is called breakpoint chlorination, and that's where the upward sloping line starts after the hump on the graph. Okay, I get what you're saying there, Detective H2O, but I still don't get what it has to do with us. We test our water for free chlorine every shift. Not monochloramine, but free chlorine. It is within the control range every time. That should be good enough, shouldn't it? What gives? Yes, you make an excellent point, which brings me to the second part of my story. What you see isn't always what you get. Monochloramine can be a positive interference to the DPD free chlorine test you use. That means even though the sample turns pink and you think you have a true free chlorine residual in your water, it is actually monochloramine interfering with your test. You don't have the killing power you think you have in your water, which would certainly explain the biological fouling on your RO membranes. And you're sure this is happening to us? I tested the water prior to disinfection for ammonia and found it. Look at this level. To reach breakpoint chlorination, you need to feed a weight ratio of 8 to 1 or higher of chlorine to ammonia. Based upon your records and data, you're only feeding enough chlorine to get halfway up the hump. There's no true free chlorine at all to do the disinfection you want. Wow! What do we do? You have a few options. First, you can feed more chlorine to the system to reach breakpoint chlorination and beyond to your true free chlorine control range. Second, you could supplement the chlorine biocide with another biocide, which is RO membrane compatible. Third, you could look at replacing the chlorine biocide with another one that may be more effective considering your current water conditions. There are other options we may be able to consider as well. There are pluses and minuses that come with each option. We can do a thorough feasibility analysis on each of these options, but let's prove my theory first by feeding more chlorine. That sounds like a good plan, Detective H2O. Thanks for your time. Detective H2O's suspicion were proven to be true over the coming year as the RO membrane cleaning intervals increased from weekly to quarterly. After initially increasing the chlorine feed, a disinfection feasibility study was conducted, systems were piloted, and changes were made that increased the cleanings to every six months. Detective H2O had truly saved the day once again. In the underbelly and penthouses of the metropolis of Waterville, where the boilers percolate and cooling towers fog, there is one man who works tirelessly to end corrosion, stop scale, fight low-life microbes, and conserve water. That man is Detective H2O, best water treater this side of the Ohio, solving water problems, drop by drop. James, thanks again for that. Those are so much fun. And folks, I want to mention again, try to do something fun. Take a picture by your wastewater system. Do something and hashtag it to IWW20. Tomorrow is our very last day of Industrial Water Week celebration. We're going to be celebrating careers with Careers Friday. So tomorrow is your last day to show us your water cake. If you don't have the recipe, you can go to the show notes page. We'll have that recipe for that cake for you. You can let us know what you think when you put the main ingredient in a cake as water. And folks, I hope you share that with somebody. I hope you get a picture of you sharing that with somebody. I hope you've enjoyed all the things that we brought to you this week. And I'm going to close out this episode just like I've closed out all the other episodes with a quote. This one is by Ben Franklin. When the well is dry, we all know the worth of water. Folks, I hope you know the worth of water and I hope you know the worth of you being an industrial water treatment professional. See you tomorrow, folks. 